सतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शाति 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 ओम लीड अस फ्रॉम दि अनरियल टू द रियल लीड अस फ्रॉम डार्कनेस अन टू लाइट लीड अस फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोर्टैलिटी ओम पीस 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 Namaste and good evening all of you. Thank you for having me here. It's always a pleasure to come to the Vedanta Society here in Rhode Island in in Providence. Um Maharaj is always very kind even in his absence, you know, he's on tour and he made arrangements for this talk. The subject um is the st- sage of stabilized uh, the stabilizing enlightenment sthita pragya the st- sage of stabilized wisdom you see this comes from a question which comes to all of us after we have been in vedanta for a while we all hear that our real nature is not the body not the mind and there is the body and the mind obviously but that's not what we are we are spiritual beings uh, we are um, pure consciousness awareness and then we study methods of analysis of our experience of ourselves and we see how in what sense first we try to understand what sense we are not the body in what sense we are not the mind and what sense we are pure consciousness and how that solves our problems you know pure consciousness cannot it's not born it does not die it does not undergo um, old age disease uh, sorrow frustration um, it's not subject to desires so if that's our real nature in that case i am beyond problems i overcome suffering and that's how vedanta proposes to achieve this goal of uh, spiritual practice to transcend suffering to attain fulfillment basically our identification with this body mind that i am this limited person that's at the root of all our uh, suffering that's at the lo- root of all our lack of fulfillment this is a very limited creature and if i am just this creature there is not much i can do about the human condition everything even all psychology and therapy is just fine tuning you can still be abnormal still be unhappy still be neurotic just functional that's the best that <laughs> you know there were these comics we read um, as kids one series was asterix and obelix about the two little gauls who fought against the romans in, in ancient uh, uh, gaul and one of the stories was that they go to a, a, a the druids were the therapists in those days so they go to a druid who is famous for curing mental illness and um, the, they see all the patients sitting outside and one guy who's on all fours and yapping and yipping and goes into the hut of the druid what's wrong with him oh he thinks he's a dog so he goes in and then he comes out in walking straight and people are amazed wow he's cured he does he not think that he's a dog anymore oh he still thinks he's a dog he just the druid just taught him to beg you know stand like this <laughs> that all that we can reasonably expect as long as we think we are rooted in this earthly flesh if that's all we are there's not much more than we, you can you can expect from this but vedanta not just vedanta in fact every religion every mystical tradition it tells you one thing in different language different philosophies different theologies different mythology it tells us that we are not uh, mere mortal beings we are spiritual beings and the realization of this this is the word realization is very interesting to realize means to know oh i real i just realized that means i just came to know that's one thing but realize also has another meaning to make real to make real so once we realize that we are this um, spiritual being that in vedanta it's very clear what is meant by a spiritual being uh, that you're not uh, an objective body mind but you are the pure subject pure awareness and then 
the promise is we will uh, overcome the limitations of material existence that we will attain fulfillment and we will see in what sense, in a deep sense, we are beyond suffering. Now, what happens is, once we read all that, we read the techniques, uh, you know, the method of the seer and the seen, the method of the analysis of the five levels of the human personality, the method of the uh, three states of waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, and how you are the witness of those three. Multiple methods are given in the Upanishads, very ancient methods, deep, sophisticated, philosophical tools for giving us this insight so that we can realize, in the first sense of the word realize, come to know who we are, who am I, we get the answer to that. And if we persist in it, as most of us here we have, for years and years we have studied or listened to Vedanta, we begin to get a sense of what is being said. But now our next question is that uh, it doesn't seem to work. The realize in the second sense, to make it real. Now I understand realize in the first sense. But realize something to make it real, that doesn't seem to be happening. If you make it real, the goal was, the promise was, you will overcome suffering. You will attain fulfillment. I don't feel particularly fulfilled. I don't feel that I have... Um, overcome suffering, I still react to the world in the same old ways. So how have I overcome suffering? How have I attained fulfillment by Vedanta? I'm not getting the results which were promised to me. It's not yet real for me. How do I live this Vedanta? How do I make the results real for me? This is sort of the subject of today's talk. This question, um, Arjuna had this question. He says, suppose I realize this, if I become enlightened, then what, how will my life be different? H how will it, what will it look like? Advaita Vedanta, non-dual Vedanta, doesn't say that it's just enlightenment, freedom from suffering, freedom from the cycle of birth and death, freedom from samsara, after death, a post-mortem spirituality, if you will. No, that's there, but that's not what's being uh, uh, promised. Again and again we read in the Upanishads, in the Gita, Ihaiva, here, here, in this life, now, in this body, in the life we are leading, we can be fully enlightened, the ideal of a Jivan Mukta, free while living in this body. So how do I attain that? And what will it be like to attain that? So Arjuna asks this question. The way he asks this question to Krishna is, at the end of the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, after Krishna has already taught him the doctrine of the Atman, that you are pure consciousness, you are immortal being, you, you are that which the sword cannot cut, you are that which the wa water cannot drown, fire cannot burn, uh, air cannot uh, desiccate, and so on. You are immortal, you are not subject to birth and death. Death is nothing to you, it's like a change of clothes. When clothes get um, dirty, you, you put it in the laundry basket and you put on a new suit of clothes. Exactly like that, when bodies become old and worn out, we discard old bodies and go on to new ones. It seems as easy as that. We go through such tremendous... I'm just quoting from the Gita verses, very famous verses. We go through tremendous changes in the course of one lifetime, of one body, from babyhood to childhood to youth, teenage, youth, middle age, old age. So these dramatic transformations we go through, death is one more dramatic transformation. In this way, Krishna teaches Arjuna that you are not the body subject to birth and death. You are not even the mind which is subject to constant upheavals, ups and downs. So that's been taught. He teaches karma yoga, how you can prepare yourself for uh, you know, using daily activities, uh, spiritualizing your life. You prepare yourself for the higher knowledge. All that has been taught. Now Arjuna asks this question at the end of the second chapter. Suppose I do get this enlightenment which you are promising. What will it be like? Sthita pragyasya ka bhasha, sthita dhikim prabhash, samadhisthasya keshava, sthita dhikim prabhasheta, kimasita, vrajeta kim. Oh Krishna, how would you define an enlightened person? And it, the word he uses for an enlightened person is very interesting. Established wisdom, sthita pragya. What is pragya? Wisdom. But what kind of wisdom? Not a general term for a wise person. Aham brahmasmi. I am Brahman. I am existence, consciousness, bliss. Chidananda rupa shivoham. 
I'm of the nature of Shiva, I'm of the nature of limitless awareness. This realization, suppose somebody gets it. In the state of deep meditation, what is this person like? And out of the state of deep meditation, when the person is interacting with the world, how does this person talk and mix with the world, you know, interact with people? How does this person withdraw? Literally, how does this person talk? How does this person walk, walk around? How does this person sit? Of course, it's not just about sitting, walking around and talking. It's, more, it's deeper than that. But basically a question about how the enlightened person, what's it like to be enlightened? And how is it different from what I am right now? Now, though this might be interesting, we all might be curious, what is it like to be enlightened? What practical use it, is it to us right now? There, Shankaracharya in his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, in his Bhashya, the commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, he says, uh, he says that, uh, introducing this section of the Gita, the second, end of the second chapter, he says, Sarvatrevai Adhyatma Shastra, everywhere in spiritual texts, in spiritual teachings, spiritual shastras, um, Kritarthasya Lakshanani Yani, whatever are the natural characteristics of the enlightened one. The word used is Kritartha, a very beautiful word, which means one who has accomplished the ends of life, one who has done what has to be done. So, the characteristics of a liberated one, enlightened one, whatever are the natural characteristics of an enlightened one, tani eva sadhana upadishyante, those are instructed as, given as instructions for practice for the rest of us. Why? Yatna sadhyatvat, because by effort, by consistent practice, one can reach that state of enlightenment. So, what Krishna is teaching us, going to teach us now, what we'll talk about now, are yes, directly those are answers to Arjuna's questions, description of the enlightened one, which is interesting in its own right. But also, these are advanced practices for Vedanta students. If you have been in Vedanta long enough, these are the questions we are asking, how do I live my life in the light of Vedanta now? There are preliminary practices, moral practices, clean up your life, lead an ethical life, try. Devotional practices, have a devotional practice to God in some form, deity. Karma yoga, transform your activities into selfless, not selfish. And dhyana, meditation, our minds are very fickle. Learn to concentrate and focus your mind through meditation. Maybe mantra japa, deity meditation, some kind of mindfulness. So these are all preliminary. Preliminary to what? The, the um, central practice of non-dual Vedanta, which is Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. You uh, listen to the teachings, you contemplate it, and you meditate upon the clarity thus gained. Now, what more when you have clarity? I get it, but it's still not working. I have not realized. So then what more? So you can see it's pretty advanced. We are not talking about the beginning. We are talking about matters at the end. So, one question just might be, do, enlight do people who have already got clarity about Vedanta, do they need any spiritual practices at all? And this issue is raised by Vidyaranya Swami, the great author, medieval Vedanta master who, who lived in the Vijayanagar kingdom in the south of India about 600 years ago. He is famous for his book Panchadashi, 15 chapters on Vedanta. But he's also famous for another book, Jivan Mukti Viveka, an analysis into this phenomenon of liberated while living, enlightened while living. So it's a wonderful, it's a manual for advanced spiritual practitioners. So there he raises this question. Do people who, who have got clarity, I get it, I am the witness consciousness, do they need any more spiritual practice? And he says, yes, they do. Yes, they do. Why? He says, there are two, here, two kinds of candidates, spiritual seekers. He calls them kritopasti, those who have completed the course of spiritual practices. Akritopasti, those who have not completed the course of spiritual practices and yet have got a deep, clear Vedantic insight. Many of you will go, that's me, the second one. <laughs> the first one is who has done all the hard work. What's the hard work? Has purified the mind so that worldly desires are cleansed. A pure heart. 
most important. What does Jesus say in the New Testament, in the Bible? Who will see God? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see God, literally. So, purify the heart by uh, uh, you know, sweeping out desires. Easier said than done. Converting one's life into a life of service, you know, a life of blessedness, Vivekananda said. Blessedness and helpfulness. Deep devotion and reliance on God in matters, worldly matters, in spiritual matters also. The ability to focus and meditate deeply in stillness and silence for long periods of time. All that has been accomplished to a great degree. This is called a Krito Upasti, a person who has completed the course of practice in Karma Yoga, in Bhakti Yoga, and in Raja Yoga, Dhyana Yoga. When such a person, if this person gains a clarity in Vedanta, it will lead straight to enlightenment and Jivan Mukti, uh, stabilized wisdom. But if the preliminaries are not strong, you go, that's me, that's me. <laughs> the preliminaries are not strong. If I can't honestly say I've overcome all my worldly desires, if I can't honestly say that um, you know, I am not yet if I, if I feel that I'm not yet fully dependent on God and I'm, I'm overflowing with devotion to God, if I can't claim that, if I can't claim that my mind can be concentrated in deep meditation for long periods of time and stilled, if I cannot do that, in that case I fall in that category. Such persons too can get an insight into Vedanta and into insight into the nature that I, of our real nature, not that I'm not body-mind, I'm this witness awareness. It's not difficult to get. But what will happen in that case is, it will not translate into enlightenment. You will get the feeling that I have mastered a rather cool philosophy. You know, I learned something very exciting, very, very deep about our real nature, um, and something that is very inspiring. But the moment I try to take it out for a spin on the road, crash. <laughs> I have a car crash. I get upset, I get irritated, I get unhappy. Uh, I, am, I have many complaints about the world and people have many complaints about me. So it is not quite an enlightened life. So what practices do I need? Such a person such a person needs a further course of practices, but advanced practices. What are they? Krishna gives answers. And it's a beautiful section. Sthita Pragya. Sthita Pragya. Uh, from the 55th verse of the second chapter till the end of the second chapter, 72nd verse. All of it is worth deep study and contemplation. We have to memorize the Gita or portions of the Gita at least when we were novices as brahmacharis. And I have heard of at least more than one case when somebody was, somebody was hopeless at memorizing and they were told just memorize that portion of this uh, second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. That's enough if you memorize that portion. So it's a beautiful portion. We will, um, it's worth studying and contemplating. However, the crucial part of it is in the first four verses which Krishna talks about. So I will tell you those verses and give you an executive summary and then dive into some interesting details because we won't have time for anything more than that. First I'll tell you what the verses are. Krishna says, Sri Bhagavan Vacha Prajahati Yada Kaman Prajahati Yada Kaman Sarvan partha manogatan atmanevatmana tushta stita pragyasta duchyate. Says, O partha, O Arjuna, when a person, uh, when the spiritual seeker has completely eradicated all the desires of the heart, manogatan, all desires in the mind, not in you. Very interesting dis distinctions. Anyway, I won't, won't dive into it. I'll just tell you the meaning of these verses and can center, can become centered in one's own nature as the Atman, as you know, pure consciousness. Atman completely centered in meditation, absorbed in the Atman. Then one says that this person's realization, understanding, wisdom is stabilized. Second, Dukkeshu anudvigna mana, sukeshu vigata spriya, vitaraga bhaya krodha, 
sthita dhimu niruchyate. That one is called a sage of, um, of settled wisdom. The one who is unperturbed in the middle of sorrows, dukkha. And not hankering after, thirsting after, in the middle of uh, pleasures. Who has transcended uh, craving, fear and anger. Such a person's wisdom is firmly fixed. Second instruction. Third. Yasarvatra navisneya tat tat prapya shubha shubham nabhinandati nadveshti tasya pragya pratishthita That one's wisdom is firmly stabilized who when confronted with the pleasant and the unpleasant the auspicious and the inauspicious the, the welcome and the unwelcome you know shubha shubha nabhinandati nadveshti who uh, neither rejoices when things go his way, uh, your way, and nor plunges into, you know, this is awful, this is terrible, into, into depression when things do not go your way. Sarvatra Navisneya has affection, love, but nowhere attachment. Such a person's wisdom is said to be f firmly stabilized. These are the three key instructions. And one more is there, which is sort of foundational for all this. A capacity, a discipline. Yada sangharate chayam kurmangani vabharata indriyan indriyathebhya tasya pragya pratishthita When you have the capacity of withdrawing, you know, like a tortoise withdraws, it, withdraws its limbs into its shell at the first sign of danger. The capacity to withdraw from sense contact, the senses from sense contact. It's like the ability to throw a switch, a light or a fan or whatever, switch it, can, can, like a flipping a switch, you can switch it off. You can cut off your contact with the world. You have that much control over your senses, about your engagement with the world. I mean, how many times a quarrel has gone on because there's something screaming at the back of my mind, back off, don't say one more word. But we have to give one more reply to that, <laughs> to set that guy right. And that perpetuates a quarrel. And the inability to control the, what's called the motor organs. Inability to control the sense organs. Addicted because I couldn't stop seeing. Addicted because I couldn't stop, stop tasting. Addicted because I couldn't stop touching or smelling. Get caught. Sense organs, motor organs. Not for nothing, there's an American word, motor mouth. <laughs> Can't... Control. <laughs> you might say, but I was right. But the interesting thing is guilt. Afterwards we regret it. What, have you noticed how strange this uh, a phenomenon is guilt or regret? I did it. I said it. And then I disown it. Because I disown it in a sense, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't said that. Which means it's an interesting division within myself. I, my earlier self, I'm disowning it. There was something wrong there. So often it can be just be a matter of discipline, of the ability to cut it short from within. So anyway, Sri Krishna makes a big deal out of it. Because after that, several verses which follow this are on this subject. The, the ability uh, to control one's senses. This is very important because Swami Vivekananda has written a note on the four yogas. Yoga of knowledge, the yoga of meditation, the yoga of love, and the yoga of action, or service. One paragraph each for an American disciple. More than 100 years ago he wrote this. And uh, uh, for the way of knowledge, Vedanta, the way of inquiry, the way of knowledge, he says, on this path, Many come to an understanding, few realize. See, This path consists chiefly in the control of the senses. Which is an interesting observation. Because we would think this path consists chiefly in uh, YouTube lectures and reading uh, uh, and, and logical arguments and uh, reading Vedanta text. No, no, no. So that's why there's this fourth one, which Krishna says is the foundation of the other practices. All right. 
Executive summary. Here I'm borrowing from a sadhu who put it very beautifully in Hindi. I'll tell you in Hindi and translate. What Krishna has taught here, what can we take away from this, what, we, what can we as Vedanta practitioners immediately start practicing in our day-to-day -day lives, these advanced practices. Executive summary. The first three verses, one, one phrase each for each one of them. He said, I'll quote and explain. He said, Bodh me ekta, chit me samata, vevahar me asangata. Bodh, in your realization that we are all one consciousness, one non-dual consciousness, the Atman. Be centered in that. One, that's the first practice. That's the meaning of the first instruction that Krishna gives to Arjuna. Second, chit me sam samata. An evenness of mind. Do not let anything disturb the serenity of your mind. That was the second instruction. In the midst of sorrow and uh, happiness. Third, about our interactions with people and the world. Vyavahara, transactions with the world. That's the real source of disturbance. Vyavahar me asangata, a detachment, non-attachment. You flow like water in the midst of you know, the world. Do not get stuck up anywhere. Do not get stagnant with anybody, anything, any place. Wherever you are, you are a spiritual sh seeker. You, your truth shines out there. But you are not grasping onto anything. Why not? Because you would, then we would be grasping onto falsity. Whatever you grasp in the world, that is continuously changing. It's only in our delusion we think, I'm holding on to this place, this state of health, this financial security, that person. All of those are continuously changing. That was the Buddha's great insight. That in a world of com continuous change, if you grasp something, dukkha, the result is sorrow. Anityam, anityam, sarvam, anityam. Impermanent, impermanent. Indeed, all is impermanent. Kshanikam, kshanikam, sarvam, kshanikam. Not just impermanent. Momentary, momentary. All is momentary. Not just impermanent and momentary. Shunyam shunyam sarvam shunyam. Empty, empty, indeed all is empty. And so, because everything is impermanent, nay, momentary, nay, not even that, empty, therefore, dukkham dukkham sarvam dukkham. Sorrow, sorrow, all is sorrow. But there is a crucial thing which is implicit there. It need not be sorrow. The enlightened ones also exist in this world of impermanence and emptiness. But they are beyond sorrow. How is that possible? We seek to grasp the changing as the non-changing, the momentary as lasting, and the empty as substantial. That's why we, are, we, are, uh, we, we suffer. So the, in, in transactions, in our interactions with the world, vyavahar me asangata, detachment. Don't tell people, they'll feel hurt. From today onwards, I'm going to be detached from you. No, it's an attitude from inside. I'm very happy with all of you. But I'm very happy without all of you also. I remember this uh, monk I met in the high Himalayas. Um, so um, I lived in a cottage next to his. Uh, he looked like, if you have seen these wonderful movies made on Tolkien's books, The Lord of the Rings. So there was a magician with a row, like a white robe and a long white beard and long white hair, Gandalf the magician. He looked exactly like that. I mean, it's incredible, the resemblance. He was a Punjabi tall and uh, powerfully built and long white um, <laughs> hair. And, and I went in summer, so this was Gangotri. And there were a lot of pilgrims who would come there in summer. And the children loved this uh, monk because they found him fascinating. And his hair was so long he used to roll it up and keep it hanging in, uh, you know, uh, like bundles. He would tie it up and so on. So the kids would come, laugh and joke. And I asked him once, Swami, you're so happy now. All of these people are coming and visiting you. But you stay in the winter months. He's one of the rare few who stays high up there in the winter months, six months of no contact with the world except a few monks. In the bitter cold, he stays there um, in absolute solitude. So what happens when nobody's around? His answer was very beautiful. I'll tell you what he said in Hindi and then translate. He said, 
महात्मा जी अब मैं अब मजे में हूं और तब और भी मजे में रहता हूं नाउ ओ मंक नाउ आई एम इन ग्रेट जॉय एंड देन इन दो सिक्स मंथ्स ऑफ सॉलीट्यूड आई सी सॉलीट्यूड आई एम इन ग्रेटर जॉय इट्स इवन मोर फन सी दैट इज व्यवहार असंगता दैट इज डिटैचमेंट डिटैचमेंट इन इन ट्रांजेक्शन राइट दैट्स इट दैट्स द टॉक नाउ I am going to focus on one or two aspects of it in the time remaining to me, and then we can do some uh, question answers. I am going to dive into one or two interesting aspects of this. Really, our problem is uh, when we are faced with unpleasant circumstances. That's really when our problem arises. We are unable to remain centered in our nature as this witness consciousness. When people um, misbehave with us. when things don't go the way we want when our health is not good or the climate is not good whatever or i don't find parking or whatever <laughs> we become upset when things do not go our way how do i handle that so there's the second verse krishna says dukkheshu anudvigna mana sukheshu vigatas priya in the middle of sorrows you are unperturbed you are serene how so let's take a closer look at this first off straight off one might notice uh, sorrows what do you mean sorrows wasn't the whole deal that if i am a uh, spiritual seeker if i am a vedantin i will overcome sorrow transcend sorrow you like, literally promised this at the beginning of the talk what is the goal of vedanta dukkha nivritti uh, cessation of sorrow why just vedanta what did the buddha promise there is sorrow in this world there is a cause of sorrow which is desire there is a cessation of sorrow which is nirvana and there is a method to achieve that cessation of sorrow in the eightfold way we memorized this in history class as kids for examinations the four noble truths yes so sorrow is the problem overcoming sorrow is the goal now you are saying for the enlightened person you are saying the in the midst of sorrows why is the enlightened one in the midst of sorrows shouldn't he have overcome sorrows do sorrows keep coming for the uh, for the enlightened one yes they do if you look at the lives of saints they seem to suffer sometimes more than us sri ramakrishna passed from throat cancer jesus christ was crucified and the buddha is there yes the buddha the buddha uh, died from a uh, food poisoning in old age hmm? so they had old age disease death so what's what's going on here am i missing something so this is luckily we have the answer from the buddha himself one of the monks asked buddha in his lifetime and this is from the original pali sources um i have a question what's the question you taught us that there is suffering in the world and suffering is of the form of old age disease death these are the big the biggies but there are all lots of other suffering also like not fi- finding parking i mean joking but anyway all of that is this all of that is suffering all right so what's the question and you said that you have found a way out of suffering you have gone beyond suffering and you are teaching it to us and we are practicing it you are followers we monks but i notice we are all getting old and some of us are sick some have died and you are getting old to buddha live to live to a ripe old age of 80 So you are getting old too. You are getting on in years. I'm sure you, one day you will also die, get um, you know sick and die. So how have you overcome suffering? Do you see the logical structure of the question? There is suffering, you said, consisting of old age, disease, death, and many other things. And you have found a way out of suffering. You claim to have gone beyond suffering, and you are teaching us that, and we are practicing it. But all of us are having old age, disease, death, and all kinds of sufferings. So how did it, it's not working? So Buddha's answer is that the nature of suffering is twofold. One is it's like it's like being hit by two arrows. One is the the first arrow hits you, and then suppose the second arrow hits you. Imagine the suffering. The first arrow is what the world throws at you: old age, disease, death, failure, insult, humiliation, all kinds of problems, poverty, all kinds of problems. And the second arrow is our reaction to that. the way we react to it and the buddha says my humble submission to is our real suffering lies in that second arrow 
What I teach will take away the suffering from that second arrow. What the world does, that I cannot do anything about. The world will go on in its own way. And that's true. It's a simple truth. And if you look at the lives of the saints, those who seem to be so fulfilled, so joyous, in, they are joyous in the midst of suffering, in spite of suffering. It's not a promise that you will never be sick again. All your debts, student loans and all will be forgiven. <laughs> and um, you will permanently live in heaven out there, hereafter. None of that promise. That's not the promise. The promise is, in spite of all this, you will find perfect peace and ease in the midst of all of this. No matter what the world throws at you, you will not suffer. That's the promise. Sri Ramakrishna would talk about the boat being in the water, but water not being in the boat. The lotus being in the water, but the water does not wet the leaf of the lotus. It, it slides off the leaf. How do you do that? For that, dukkha, suffering, we need to investigate it a little deeper in order to know how to handle it. These are all from an advanced perspective. So how do you handle that? We investigate dukkha, suffering, from three perspectives. In Sanskrit, these are called karana drishti, vastu drishti, sadhana drishti. Karana drishti from our causal perspective, vastu drishti from, um, from its nature. Nature perspective, what is it actually? And then sadhana drishti, from a practice perspective, what practice is to be done? What is the cause of suffering? Deeper and three levels of deeper understanding. First, preliminary. When you come across this question of suffering in all these texts, all these Hindu, Buddhist, Jain texts, they talk about three causes of suffering. Adi Bhautika, Adi Daivika, Adhyatmika. One is, Problems caused by nature, are the uh, daivika. It's too hot, or too cold, or earthquakes in Syria and Turkey, or a volcano, or something. Um, all of that is caused by nature, a natural cataclysm, big or small. Then uh, uh, adhibhautika, the trouble we get from other living beings. It could be your annoying neighbor, or it could be the COVID virus, whatever it is all kinds of other living beings, the trouble that we get from other living beings, sentient beings. And then uh, adhyatmika, the trouble that we get in our body-mind. An intelligent listener would ask, wait a minute, all trouble and suffering has to come to the body-mind, only then it becomes suffering to me. That's true, but the analysis is, what is the actual cause of these sufferings? It'll come. A heat and cold will make me suffer only when I feel it on my skin. Right? But still, the cause is there. So, depending on causes, there are these three levels of causes. Um, natural, from suffering from sentient beings, and suffering from one's own body-mind. Physical, mental suffering. A deeper analysis. What is the cause of suffering? Let's ask again, more deep. The analysis is that it is dukkha karavritti. It's a mental modification in the form of suffering. It is awful. It is miserable. How bad it is. Ain't it so bad? This kind of mental modification, that is the nature of suffering. That's the cause of suffering. It's not really whether it's heat or cold. It's that the mental modification I have in the mind. Mental modification means the thought. The understanding that I have in the mind. Notice the Buddha's second arrow. The mental modification in the mind, chitta vritti. I'm translating chitta vritti. The, the thought in the mind, the understanding in the mind is, it's so cold, I'm so cold and miserable. That's the cause of suffering, not the actual temperature out there. Um, so, dukkha kara vritti. And somebody says something. So, is that the cause of suffering? That's a distant cause. The real cause is when I react with, I feel so hurt and offended by what that person said. It was uh, 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 Eleanor Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt who said that nobody can hurt you without your permission. Yeah. She's talking about the dukkha karavritti, the modification in the mind, the immediate reaction in the mind is horrible. That person has hurt me. I'm so hurt, I'm so miserable. No, no, many people won't like this because it's easier to blame the other person than to say that actually it's my mental modification. True, that person has contributed. Nobody's denying the person is being nasty. 
But I'm contributing to it also by wh what I'm thinking. And then a lot of, in fact, at this level, a lot of what is called cognitive behavior therapy, it takes place at this level. How we are interpreting what is happening in the world. There was um, the predecessor to cognitive behavior therapy, a very well-known psychologist, um, uh, the rational emotive behavior ther therapy. Albert Ar Ellis? Albert Ellis, yes, REBT. Not many people read him these days, but he was an amazing uh, uh, psychologist and analyst and therapist. New York. Uh, REBT, that has become the modern cognitive behavior therapy, but that was the seed idea. So he talks about ABCD, uh, the um, actuating the, the circumstances, the activating event, what happens in the world outside. And um, the consequent behavior, what, how I react to it. So A is what, what happens in the world, how people behave, what's going, going on in my body also. C is the consequence, the consequent behavior, how I react to it. In between, he points out, often un unlooked is B. B is our belief system. So a dog barks at me and I get scared. It won't do if you're in New York. Everybody loves dogs. There. You're surrounded by dogs. So it bar barks at me and I get scared. I try to run away. Why? In between is a belief system. It's going to bite me because maybe as a kid I was bitten or chased by a dog. Something is there in my mind. So I, it becomes, immediately becomes reality to me. Now, A, B, C. And then he says, what do you do? D. A, B, C, D. D is debate or dispute the b belief system. Critically examine the belief system, debate it. Is it true? Do all barking dogs bite? Are everybody getting bitten all over the place? So, like that. Now this is at the second level. The, um, the dukkha kara vritti, the mental modification in the form of sorrow. Then third, even deeper than that, is dukkha abhimana. Owning that mental modification as I am unhappy. Look, a subtle distinction. Something happens in the world and then there is a reaction in the mind. This is awful. This is suffering. Deeper than that is my identification with it. I am suffering. I am miserable. Something happens in the world. Inside the mind is, oh, misery. Then, but deeper than that, I am miserable. That owning that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, vritti in the mind, that I am miserable. Dukkha vritti abhimana. Identification with the mental modification in the form of sorrow. This is the deepest one. So what can we do about it? That's where Vedanta works actually. It switches the uh, identification. I am body-mind. In that case, when the misery comes in the mind, it's automatic for me. I am miserable. I am the witness of the body-mind. Then when the misery comes in the mind, I'm the witness of that. I am not miserable. And it's in fact a fact. It's a fact. How does that help? When this is my understanding that I am the witness of the flash of misery and unhappiness in the mind. I am not miserable, I am witness of that. I was the witness of the calm mind as the witness of the happy mind. I am the witness of the miserable mind. Again, I will be the witness of the calm mind or the happy mind. I am not uh, miserable or um, uh, happy or, or even calm. I am beyond all of those. Those are states of the mind. When you do that, the mind actually calms down. Mind calms down. I have told this story about the, um, the, the sadhu in the Himalayas who was approached by a gentleman who said to that sadhu, I am very, very unhappy. And that monk said to this gentleman, are you aware of your unhappiness? Do you see your unhappiness? He says, I see it, that's why I am here. Here is unhappiness. I feel very unhappy. So I'm aware of it. And therefore I'm here. If you're aware of it, if you see your unhappiness, then you cannot be unhappy. You are the seer of the unhappiness. That which you see is an object. You are the seer of that object. The seer and the seen are two different things. I see this cloth. 
and the eyes which see and the cloth which is seen, they're two different things. Similarly, I see the unhappiness in the mind. I am the seer of the unhappiness. By that very fact, I am not unhappy. Imagine, it's exactly the opposite of what we think. Feeling of unhappiness, it, it's just a given fact for me, I am unhappy. Here he's saying, feeling of unhappiness, it's a given fact that you are not unhappy. That proves that you are not unhappy, because you are the witness of that unhappiness. In Hindi he said, Tum dukh ke drashta ho, tum dukhi nahi ho. You are the witness of that um, uh, feeling of uh, sorrow. You are not unhappy. Now the next thing, the point of the story lies next. That man thought in that way, and when you think in that way, your mind calms down. So he comes to the teacher and he says, the monk and he says, Aap thik, thik bolte te, you said, what you said was right. I am Now I am very peaceful. Immediately the monk scolded him. Tum shant nahi ho, tum shanti ke drashta ho. You are, you are not peaceful. You are the witness of the peace in your mind. See, that's very valuable because the moment you identify with the peace in the mind, you're trapped again. The moment this mind, peace in the mind will go away. The mind is continuously changing. And the, the person, when he goes down from the Himalayas and back into New Delhi traffic, <laughs> he'll say, oh, I was so uh, peaceful in the Himalayas. Now I am so uh, uh, upset. I am so um, you know, restless. No, I am the witness of the peace of the mind. Therefore, I'm, if there is restless the, restlessness in the mind, I am the witness of that too. I am of the constant nature, therefore I am not peaceful. I am peace itself. Upanishad says your name is Shantam. The name of the, name of the self itself in uh, Mandukya is that you are peace itself. So, that is a deeper understanding of sorrow. Identification with the sorrowful modifications in the mind. This is called Karana Drishti, an investigation into the cause of sorrow. Three, threefold cause of sorrow. First, external, um, na natural, from sentient beings, from body, mind. That's most preliminary. Second level is the mental modification in the form of it's, it's miserable, it's bad. Third, deeper, identification with that mental modification. Now, let's go on to what exactly is sorrow from the Vedantic perspective. Vastu Drishti, that sorrow itself. We have discussed the causes of sorrow, but what is it exactly? From Vedanta, from Advaita perspective. Three levels. The highest actual truth, straightforward answer is Brahma Swarupa. It is the ultimate reality itself. It means sorrow, <laughs> sorrow is the ultimate reality. No. Brahman exact existence, consciousness, place. It's like the same gold made into um, the image of Shiva and into the image of a demon. Now, if it was melted, the image of the demon is melted and now made into a beautiful image of Shiva. If you ask, what is that Shiva? Exactly what the demon was, you'll be horrified. You're saying that the Shiva is a demon. Is it God is a demon? No. But the material which you took to be a demon, the material which you now take to be Shiva is exactly the same, it is literally the same gold which was melted, melted and refashioned into this image. Similarly, it is Brahman alone. If there is a non-dual reality, non-dual means no second, then anything and everything we encounter in this world, including ourselves, must be that non-dual reality. So, sorrow, the highest understanding, ultimate understanding of what we call sorrow is nothing other than that one non-dual divinity, Brahman itself. That's too difficult, Swami. That's crazy. You are defying sorrow. Even a masochist won't do that. All right, one step lower. One little concession. It's not Brahman, it's not the ultimate reality. It is Brahma Vivarta. First one was Brahma Swarupa. Second, Brahma Vivarta. See, I'm just expanding upon what I heard a teacher say. He just said these words. What, what is the nature of sorrow? Brahma Swarupa, Brahma Vivarta, Prakriti Parinama. That's all. Now you have to exp expand upon it. What is Brahma Vivarta? An appearance of Brahman. It's not the ultimate reality, but it's an appearance. Like you would see a movie on a movie screen. On a movie screen you see tragedies sometimes, you see comedies sometimes, but you know in both cases, you may weep at a tragedy, you may laugh with a comedy, and if it's a good comedy or a good tragedy, you would weep with it and you would laugh with it. But you know all the time it's a movie, it's an appearance. What underlies that is the same screen. 
on the screen of existence consciousness place on the screen of brahman on the screen which is you plays this drama of smiles and tears of sorrows and pleasures they are appearances of your real nature they are not ultimately real but they are appearances just as you would not be terribly upset with a tragedy on screen you would not you know you wouldn't go out to the police station to file a um, uh, report and, and uh, prosecute the villains in in the movie uh, similarly you would not be terribly upset with your own being upset it's an appearance by the way all the time it's for the seeker the advanced seeker in vedanta don't apply it on others and somebody is weeping you say it's an appearance And then, third, if that's also too difficult, the third level of analysis of what exactly constitutes that sor- sorrow from a Vedantic perspective is a little more concession. Prakriti Parinama, it's a transformation of nature. See, it's the same nerves which carry pain and pleasure. I was just thinking today. It's the same nerves which, which give us sensations of pain, pain and pleasure. And just that the range of pain is much greater. even the n- n- sensations which give us pleasure if you intensify it and prolong it very soon it will become pain so it is just a modification of nature our n- uh, neural systems the same brain the same mind and in vedanta we'll talk about uh, sattva rajas tamas it is uh, the modification of prakriti into rajas r- rajoguna which produces pain so this is another level of analysis of pain so three levels what is pain it is a transformation in your brain and nervous system in our modern language or in a more advanced sankhyan language it is a transformation of nature into rajoguna rajas the very nature of uh, the very characteristic of rajas is pain producing then third sadhan drishti Uh, inquiry into sorrow from the perspective of spiritual practice sadhan spiritual practice from the per- uh, perspective of gyan a pa- path of knowledge pain you see pain is an offense offense against what offense against your vedantic knowledge moment you say i have clarity that i am the witness consciousness if you say i am suffering i am unhappy you are Uh, you are violating you have become a criminal you are committing an offense it's called pragya aparadha an offense against your own understanding if i am the witness consciousness people say people say i understand uh, i am the witness consciousness everybody's witness consciousness but that's not my problem swami problem is my son doesn't listen to me <laughs> you see the jump we are making I am the witness consciousness, and my son doesn't listen to me. Where does the son come in here? Whose son? Who doesn't listen to whom? From your perspective as the witness consciousness, as Atman and Brahman, your son is also the same thing. That listening to you and not listening to you, wanting your son to listen to you, and your son not wanting to listen to you, both are at which level? Not at the level of pure consciousness, at the level of the mind and behavior. that's a problem which can be tackled at that level but from your perspective as witness consciousness it shouldn't be a problem at all you should be able to deal with it with evenness of mind pragya aparadha an offense against your your received wisdom all those books you have read all the talks you have heard all the thought that you have put into i'm not the body not the mind i'm the witness consciousness that thing that knowledge this highest spiritual knowledge which we have received you are, it's an offense we're committing an offense against it by saying i am suffering i am humiliated by that person i'm angry with that other thing it's an offense don't do it. one sadhu put it very beautifully a traditional wandering monk simple advice he said prapt gyan ka aadar kare prapt gyan means the received knowledge the knowledge which we have already accumulated learn to respect that instead of accumulating more hmm. learn to respect that instead of reading more books listening to more lectures uh, uh, you know in our days the, uh, this digital technology was not there we had the latest technology at that time was the photocopier machine we would desperately photocopy you know rare books and 
प्राप्त ज्ञान का आदर करे द एक्यूमुलेटेड विजडम विच यूव ऑलरेडी गॉट ट्राई टू लिव अकॉर्डिंग टू दैट आदर मीन्स टू रिस्पेक्ट ट्राई टू लिव अकॉर्डिंग टू वॉट यू ऑलरेडी नो एंड अंडरस्टैंड दैट्स मच मोर देन एन आफ वी नो मच मोर देन वी वी कैन प्रैक्टिस वी नो मच मोर आवर नॉलेज रन्स फार अ हेड ऑफ आवर एबिलिटी टू प्रैक्टिस स्वामी विवेकानंद पुट इट दिस वे एन आउंस ऑफ प्रैक्टिस इज बेटर देन ट्वेंटी टन्स ऑफ टॉल टॉक स्वामी अद्भुतानंद जी ही वॉज अ स्ट्रेट टॉकर वन ऑफ श्री रामकृष्ण डिसाइपल्स नॉट अ पर्सन हु वॉज लिटरेट डिड नॉट रीड टू मेनी बुक्स ही वॉज फुल्ली एनलाइटन सो वेन समबडी कम्स टू हेम एंड आस प्लीज गिव गिव अस सम एडवाइस सम स्पिरिचुअल इंस्ट्रक्शन I'll tell you what he said in his broken Bengali. He was a Hindi speaker. So in his broken Bengali, what he said, I'll tell you and translate. Shalara upadesh kuriye bharai kichu korbe na. These rascals they go around collecting spiritual instructions, but they won't do anything. They won't practice anything. I did that once. I remember as a novice, and we had this wonderful Swami who was our mentor when we joined the order as monks. Uh, as a young monk uh, joined this swami was extraordinary one of the most spiritual people i've seen so i was so lucky to have him in the first one or two years two years of my spiritual life and then the time came when he was leaving he was called away to a um, you know a higher responsibility at our main monastery he was leaving the ashram where we were so the last evening i was walking with him i and other novices so i said in all enthusiasm swami please give us please give me some parting instruction and he snapped at me what i have told you the last two years if that has no <laughs> effect then what i say now will have no effect also <laughs> so this is called pragya aparada from the perspective of sadhana spiritual practice from the perspective of bhakti devotion i love god i'm devoted to god my uh, whole focus is on the devotion to god in that case all sorrow is also taken as the grace of god anugraha sorrow is not sorrow that is sorrowful when what takes me away from god is sorrowful what takes me towards god is not sorrowful what worldly people count as sorrow is no sorrow to me um so whatever we do um the result comes to us in the form of uh, the, the grace of god so even sorrow is is the grace of god that monk who was bitten by a cobra and when he was revived from the poison uh, he said somebody asked asked him what happened he said it was a messenger from the beloved the one who bit me is the same one as who is now feeding me with milk and you know, trying to revive me the messenger from the beloved sorrow sri ramakrishna gives the example of the weaver who was a devotee of rama and he would surrendered completely whole life to rama so there's a story of the will of rama rama richa so one day he was sitting there uh, at night taking the name of rama and uh, robbers came to the neighborhood and they robbed a house of a rich man the police came the robbers were running away the cops were chasing them and the robbers saw this poor man sitting there they dumped their stolen goods on him and they ran away and the cops saw that the policeman came and says oh so he's the robber they captured him and they hauled him off to jail next day he was produced in front of the magistrate and the people of the village came and said oh he's a saintly soul he couldn't be a robber and he was set free so when he came back people asked him what happened what happened and he said by the will of rama i was uh, weaving and taking the name of rama by the will of rama the robbers came by the will of rama they were chased by the police by the will of rama they dumped their stolen goods on me by the will of rama the police captured me and by the will of rama i was in jail by the will of rama i found myself in front of the magistrate and by the will of rama he set me free and by the will of rama here i am before you that's how he treats sorrow dukkha that is bhakti drishti it's the is the will of god i'm fine with it not easy but then no spiritual practice is easy then there is a karma drishti a sadhana spiritual practice from from the perspective of karma karma is good good bad bad none escape the law in vivekananda's uh, formulation good karma what is which is called dharma consciously done moral action uh, is produces what is called punya merit and that punya produces sukha happiness consciously deliberately done uh, immoral action adharma produces papa demerit papa produces dukkha sorrow 
So sukha and dukkha are the products of our past karma. But this is not spiritual. This is just a statement of fact. Now, how do you spiritualize this? If I work and whatever happens to me, the pleasures and pains are the results of my work. Now, can I convert this work into worship? If I do all my work as an offering to the Lord, just as you do puja here, and you offer some fruits and sweets, when you offer it, it's called bhoga. After the offering is over, it's called prasada. The sacred food offerings, now they are consumed by devotees as coming from the Lord. It's sacred now. Similarly, all the work that I do is puja. And the results of the work, karma phala, is prasada. Is that which is coming? What I've offered to the Lord is coming back to me now. Now, in my day-to-day -day life, the pleasant ones are very nice. The unpleasant results of my work, I, I reject. But if it's prasada, you may like um, uh, mangoes, you may not like prunes. But if it comes as prasada, if a prune comes to your hand also, you will take it as prasad. It's not, not that it's a prune is no longer very important to you. You might still prefer the mango prasad and not the prune prasad. But still, the fact that it is prasad is important. Similarly, what comes to me in life, uh, all these actions, it is prasad. The pleasant and the unpleasant are not so important. Right? So, uh, this is the karma drishti or sadhan drishti from the perspective of karma. Right, we have sort of um, time is more or less up I think I'd rather hear from you let me quickly summarize what did we talk about dukkha, about how to handle suffering karna drishti what is the cause of suffering threefold investigation three causes, external, from sentient beings from our own body, mind deeper investigation, it is the mind the thought in the mind that it's bad, unpleasant even deeper uh, cause is the identification with the thought I am unhappy. Here is unhappiness, but I am unhappy. Then the second kind of uh, investigation was vastu drishti. What is it actually? And the highest understanding, highest realization of the enlightened ones, Brahma Swarupa. It cannot be anything other than Brahman, this, this experience of sorrow. Or that is not acceptable, then Brahma Vivarta, an appearance of Brahman, like a movie, like a dream, like fiction. Or if that is also difficult, it's a transformation of nature. Don't be swept away by it. Don't be swept away by it. That particular impulse of the nerves is great. That's the goal of life. That particular impulse of the nerves are horrible. That's my life is a failure. They are nerve impulses. So transformation of nature. Sadhan drishti. From the perspective of spiritual practices. Uh, jnana. Remember pragya parada. An off offense against your own understanding. Then bhakti, it is the grace of God. I can tell you so many stories about how devotees take even sorrow as the grace of God. And then finally, karma. If I convert my action into puja, then all sukha and dukkha, the pleasant and the unpleasant, it all becomes prasada. That's, my, that's the way I take it when things come to me from the world. Go back to the executive summary. What do we take away from the whole talk? Bodh me ekata, they be centered in the knowledge that it is all one consciousness and I am that, you are that one consciousness. In your understanding, that's one. In your mind, chit me samata, never let anything disturb the evenness of mind. Third, vevahar, in your transactions with the world, asangata, detachment. Practice deliberately, consciously practice detachment. Practice not getting caught up. And finally, a foundation for all of this is a discipline of the senses. Don't let the senses raise a storm in the mind. Don't be a motor mouth. <laughs> all right, let's take a few questions. How do we do this? You raise your hand and, and the microphone comes to you. Yes. Tell us your name and ask the question. Be brief so that others can oh, get sure. a chance. My name is Sangeeta. And my question is, could you give us a practical uh, example of uh, detachment in a worldly situation? So many are there. I mean, I'll give an example from the, it's a, from a monk, but it, anybody can practice it. Uh, I remember this very monk, just, my thought just came right now, the monk whom I talked about who left the uh, ashram and went to the main uh, monastery. So they he left after 18 years of being in the ashram and being the head of this large institution. 
he left everybody went to give give him a farewell and the, you know the teachers and all they went with gifts um he accepted he was he accepted all of that he uh, was pleasant to everybody but we noticed one thing when he went from his room from the office back to his room all the gifts remained there he didn't take he didn't unwrap any one of them he didn't take anything when he left the ashram the way he had come 18 years ago i think he left with less than that it was detachment i am happy with it's not that i am a, a loner i don't like the company of people no i am happy in the company of people but i'm also happy without the company of people see when you are alone solitude you are in your own company if you are not happy in your own company why would be uh, anybody be happy in your company <laughs> so that's detachment in day to day activities yes who is next i'll come to you next yeah tell us your name and ask the question my name is tilak uh, swami ji you s- i've heard it mentioned that do not seek and do not avoid vivekananda said that yeah. w- what does that exactly mean so in a worldly sense what we do is we seek and avoid we seek when where our ambition push pushes us where our desires push us where our passions push us we seek that and what we consider um, unpleasant unhappy miserable we avoid that very carefully that's the way we function in the world but if you're a spiritual seeker your goal is not worldly happiness or to avoid worldly unhappiness your goal is god realization right so as far as the world is concerned you can't cut out the world so your world is concerned you must remain undisturbed by the world and your attitude to the world one powerful method is neither seek nor avoid and there also this is just a principle how will you apply it and some people say i am un- under pressure from my family members to attend this program or that party or this uh, festive occasion what do i do it's up to you but neither seek nor avoid means it doesn't mean that everything that comes to you you'll have to tear go there then you'll go crazy if you're a spiritual seeker in order to keep peace you may go to one uh, one such occasion out of four occasions maybe so that people don't say that you are you're nuts but if you go to four occasions out of four occasions and generate four or four more of your own then you are a party animal ne <laughs> <laughs> how are you going to become spiritual then where is the time and energy for that so neither seek nor avoid it depends it one must use common sense there spiritual practice is central but if you, your spiritual practice you end up disturbing the world around you husband wife father mother everybody is uh, upset because of your spirituality and i am in peace you can't be in peace then uh, i remember i went to india when in the big city there was a talk in this very big institution this lady stood up and she asked this this almost similar question and she says my husband wants me to be involved in all these activities and i want to focus uh, on my spiritual study and meditation i said yes you're right next day in the morning her, her husband came running you told this to her now i am in trouble look she doesn't do these things these are important uh, parts of our social life or professional commitment i said you are right absolutely right <laughs> no it's a matter of common sense uh, to what level you uh, keeping your goal clear that my goal is spiritual life and at that level one also has to be firm one has to be firm also one is pretty firm when one is uh, Uh, committed to getting a degree in you know brown university or getting becoming a millionaire on wall street when well, you're pretty committed and focused and you don't take any nonsense from any anybody why not a little bit of that in spiritual life also be a little staunch and you notice people will will accept it after some time first opposition second they'll become indifferent oh he's like that last case <laughs> and third level is admiration you see people start fl- flocking around you are pulled to you after that all right the lady there yes uh namaste um i'm thinking about the ad- adhyatmika um adhyatmika the sorrow that you create for yourself in relation to the karma bhakti and jnana in that when you're working if you find that you're inadequate or you judge that your what you're doing doesn't satisfy you then how can you how 
what do you tell yourself to be able to offer something to God that you're not satisfied with yourself yeah. um, on the karma part of it and the bhakti part of it? And then thinking about jnana, uh, aparadha, um, yeah, wh how do you satisfy yourself with the knowledge that you have? And specifically as a student, when you are sort of working towards accumulating knowledge, how do you make sure that you are valuing that which you're accumulating? Yes. So, uh, as far as our karma is concerned, at what level of perfection can we offer it to God? Do the best you can. Don't be over worried. You know, perfectionism snaps the nerve of, eff uh, of effort. Perfectionism snaps the nerve of effort. Be up and doing. Remember, the Lord is all forgiving. One beautiful thing about karma yoga is our efforts in the world really have to be perfect, otherwise, the results will not come. You have to fulfill certain criteria. Then only the results will come, whether in academics or in a job or wherever, in a relationship, wherever. Whereas, anything, the Lord accepts anything which is offered out of devotion. So if, if it's offered out of love, we will do the best. When you give something in love to somebody, you, you give it with love and you do the best. It may not be really all that good. There's so many stories from Shabari and others who offered very poor things, very mean um, you know, um, things. Um, to the Lord, but they offered it with so much devotion. The Lord says, I eat the devotion, not the food which is offered. So, yes. Um, don't worry about it. Offer it with love, with tears in your eyes. That, that the Lord accepts immediately. Whether it's prayer, whether it's a puja, whether it's some kind of work done in the world. And valuing knowledge. Remember, there is no conflict between the knowledge which is gained on campus in your education and your spiritual practice. Knowledge itself is sacred, right? So, you know, gather it in as much as you can. Um, don't see a conflict between what you are studying in the university and your ultimate spiritual goals. It's all part, it's in one stream. We have no conflict then in your mind. All right, so we have run out of time, 6.15, uh, later then. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu Very good, thank you.